where you live. Where's your car right now? Where are your kids? Where's your bank account? Where do you go to withdraw money? So think of any piece of data, the sky, the earth, the stars. And we talked about various elements uh, of non-earth units and earth units. So non-earth meaning perhaps the length and width of this room. Earth meaning longitude and latitude of which there are many projections. Now there are things that move like us and our cars and there are things that don't move like where we live, our houses. Our animals, our pets and livestock move around as well. Traffic moves around. There is a sender and a receiver that might be static, that might move. But that information is, is collectible. And we have various means of collection. We look at relationships and networks from human to machine, from machine to machine, from human to machine to human, and from machine to machine to human. We've got all these different ways of creating these relationships. What happens when we dictate what information, we provide consent for data to be collected? I want some points, so when I visit a cafe, I, I use an application that's location-based, and I give it the thumbs up. It's checked me in. And when I leave, it checks me out. When I use my Opal card to travel around in South Wales, I go to the entry gantry, which is at the station or at the bus stop. I tap on, and remember that voice that you hear? Remember to tap on, you know? and you get out and it's fixing you. Your Fitbit does this continuously, so you have continuous monitoring and then discrete monitoring. Maybe I ask um, a special gadget I wear that has a GPS sensor on board to log my location and waypoints every three minutes, and we've done these experiments in Rover's PhD many years ago. Uh, and perhaps I want something to log me every three seconds. There are pinhole cameras that we've invested in uh, in another project which take photos every three seconds and tell you where those photos were taken. Just wear it and you could walk. They're not covert, they're rather overt, but they're still pinhole cameras. And we have come to this point where the difference between what is overt and covert is, is blurring a lot. I've invested both in uh, covert cameras for my cybercrime courses and also overt cameras. And these are cameras you can either hold, you can wear them, or they could be on a wall. Stationary with motion detection capability. And this itself is a mobile unit that has on average between 9 and 14 sensors packed into it. Some of these sensors tell us where we are, GPS sensors, chipsets. They may tell us if we're going up or down stairs. They may tell us how fast we're traveling. They may tell us whether we're going north, south, east or west. They may tell us whether we're upside down whether we've got sweaty palms, what our temperature reading is, and we have actually exported the data of these attributes uh, in Rover's PhD research to look at all of these. And I want you to think about carrying a device like a GPS chipset, you clip it onto your pocket or you put it in the, your khaki pants, or you, you lug it around like a mobile phone. We use three different, we actually even put an in-car device that collected information as the car moved around, and then you export the data that's been collected out. Because you want to see what it's doing. You want to look at the behavioral traits. You want to look at characteristics that are recurring, patterns and trends in the data set. One of my students at Arizona State University, Nikki Stevens, has put a tracker on her pet. And she's called that proximity surveillance. And a lot of what I've introduced to you at the moment is about surveillance. It's about tracking and monitoring, and about how we're walking towards a, a future where everything will be tracked and monitored. Uh, for example, if we look at driverless cars, a driverless car knows where it picks you up. It knows the stop over points when you drop off your kids or go to a, a, a gymnasium or go to work. It knows everything about you and possibly can, can know your patterns of movement better than you actually know yourself. But when are these applications vitally important? Uh, we've seen uh, the press talk about uh, GPS monitors for children that are secure or insecure in the case of the one that was launched by the Queensland government. But that's a security application. I want to know that my child is safe during uh, school hours. Another one might be, uh, and, and, and Dr. Abbas has started working on this already, where we look at 
you know, the case of my mother has dementia. And that notion of geofencing, I want to know every time she walks or he walks outside, a mother or father walks outside, there is an alert sent back to a care centre or back to me. Uh, law enforcement used these kinds of technologies for 20 to 30 years for it, um, extended supervision orders, ESOs, uh, with people uh, who have been convicted uh, or warned about domestic violence. Okay, so they've been apprehended. They, are, they cannot go into particular neighbourhoods or they're under house arrest or they cannot go within two kilometres or 500 metres uh, of their previous loved ones. But what happens when we are yearning for a future where everything is trackable, independent of the scenario? A future that says, for security reasons, I will give up my privacy. And it's sort of a, a trade-off. And Walkian talks about this as the trade-off, and that it shouldn't be a trade-off, that we can have privacy and security, not privacy versus security um, language. And the case uh, for that is whether we look at convenience applications, care applications, whether we see them and think, well, for convenience, I, I want the system to know that I've walked into the building so I don't have to take something out. And perhaps that's via something I'm not even carrying. It's not token based, it's facially based. Right? So I go into a kiosk, I smile, I take a selfie as they say in the literature, and I'm allowed to go in without anything but myself. My body therefore becomes the token, and my body is unique. Okay, my gaze, my gaze, uh, my fingerprints, uh, the iris, the retina, uh, even the shape of my ear, the shape of my palm, the veins, uh, and my EEG, by the way, uh, and ECG, these are all unique patterns. The way my heart beats is very different to the way yours does. So these are the new sensors that we're playing with that are not on us, they're not wearable, they're not in us, they're not implantable, but they're what I call on surface. So you either come into contact with the reader or you uh, look at a reader. But whether a technology is about care or convenience, the underlying dominant factor is control. So I wanna care for you because you're suffering from dementia. Look, I'll, I'll ask you to wear a necklace that has a GPS sensor on board. I care for you, but underlying that is about, it's about geofencing and control. Um, the same thing happens when we look at uh, the three T's. So we just spoke about the three C's, care, control, and convenience, but the three T's are tagging, tracking, and tracing. I can tag you with something, I can track you, or I can trace you end to end. And that's what we're doing with livestock to ensure that diseases are not spread uh, between animals and different farms. So we talked about video before, we talked about location, but really underlying all of this is identity, okay? And I've often posited that location is more important than identity. If I know you are sitting in that seat at the back row there, Verity, I actually don't need to know your name because you're sitting in that seat. On occasion, it's enough that I know you're sitting in that seat. And by deduction, I can know that everyone else is sitting in that seat, but if I didn't have Verity's name, I'd just say, well, who's on the list? And I can minus everyone off. Actually, it must be Verity sitting on that list, but I've assumed that based on your location. So we can get ourselves into trouble when we're making predictions just on location if we don't have the identity. So your phone has a SIM card in there. It's a subscriber identity module, SIM, S-I-M. We have sensors that give you location, and we have sensors that give you what's called condition. So identity, location, and condition, of which Rod uh, calls various things, say a state of transitivity, I've said that correctly, it's, it's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's a, a process and it's a, a circumstance. I'm in a circumstance, am I hot and flustered? Am I angry? Am I really happy and relaxed? What does my heart rate say? And we're, well, we don't realize this, the way we pick up our phone, the number of times we pick up the phone, the number of times we walk out with it, whether we put it in our pocket, in our handbag, whether we're uh, communicating with various applications, all of these are vector points that are collected by service providers for uh, allegedly, um, simply, service provisioning, right? But more is going on here today. It's about behavioral monitoring. It's about associations. It's about beliefs and sentiments. 
It's about knowing the state that you're in without knowing who you are and where you are exactly as a person would think of it. Computers know where you are and how you're feeling and what you're doing. And that's predictive. That's where analytics come in, in. We talk about predictive analytics. So if I'm running, and I, I, I need to get on that bus, and I'm like, really, really, well, the, this knows. This knows exactly what context you're in. We talk about context. Now the fallacy is that we use these sensors to replace eyewitness accounts, and we say this increases the visibility of our capacity to serve you for various needs. And the term Uber surveillance, U-B-E-R, which came out before the word Uber in terms of the taxi company, ride-sharing company, Uber surveillance was defined by M.G. Michael, my collaborator and husband in 2006. Uber surveillance talks about the fact that you can have the collection of identity information, location information, and condition information, but in actual fact, you think you are acting as if you were God from above, omnisciently looking down and understanding what the person is thinking, but in actual fact you may well be falling short of the person's state of mind. So our behaviours don't always dictate what is up here. And George Orwell once said, you know, what's in your mind uh, is private. Well, these systems are trying to derive things uh, about you uh, in a non-private way. And they sometimes get it right, they sometimes get it wrong, but this information can fall short by um, basically allowing us to manipulate information, misinform, and misrepresent. And that's saying the best we can have from this location analytics is omnipresence. It's almost like being there, but we always argue you will never be the all-seeing eye, you will never have omniscience. Finally, to say the conversion uh, of technologies such as what allegedly doesn't lie, which is video evidence of photography, and I'll say to you, it does lie. I've spoken to enough specialists in the media domain that talk about how photos can deceive. We're looking now with the deep fakes, videos can deceive. We saw, uh, uh, is it Nancy Pelosi in the US uh, who was completely deep faked out of her. Um, uh, words. So videos now require authenticating because we don't know whether they're actually true or not. The photos, for example, might be showing somebody very sad and the flag on half mast, but you don't see the generals to the right or the left. We can manipulate content like visual representations. And based on the location, you can say, but I will, look, the picture's true. It's time stamped, it's date stamped, it's location stamped. But the picture is, it's not the full story. We call that the field of view. And with location enabling, we've seen this with street view, we've got cars that are combing the streets and collecting house front data. We have geographic national address files like GNAP in Australia, which are the precise home location data sets. So you can't make a mistake on where someone lives in terms of address. And we're collapsing all this information. What if I told you the next step will be a video? A real-time video. You'll be wearing a video, I'll be wearing a video, you'll be wearing a video, and all of these fields of view acting together. What if I told you the next stage is a sensor-based application that sits just around about there and actually looks out, or perhaps some kind of skull cap, we're already measuring brain waves. Um, but we, we use some kind of additional technology to actually um, interact with the world around us, so it's our Jiminy Cricket. It keeps us honest, it keeps our ethics upright, it's also our alibi. It's the wearable device that never lies. And so we have field of views, your camera, my camera, your camera. Look, we're in this room, we've all got cameras on. That didn't happen. She wasn't at fault, she was provoked by the person outside. At the same time, we may have an audio sensor, a bit like Alexa, that's recording all our dialogue, transcribing the dialogue, sending it back to base, and there was no altercation in that room at that time. So I call these Internet of Things devices the all-seeing eyes and ears, but they're not always correct, no matter what the words say. So if I said, stop it, you're hurting me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die! Well, it looks pretty awful, right? 
Alexa thing, so better call the cops and you know fix up Katina. She's something she's lost. She's taking extra pills this morning. Can you imagine the fakes? Can you imagine the meaning that Rod is talking about? Lost and duping these law enforcement systems. We don't need soldiers. We don't need law enforcement officers. We've got these robo bots listening in. They're software bots, right? Communicating. We're going to do this all with the computers. We don't need humans to do these things. So we talk about validation, and I think um, on that I'll, I'll pass you back to the demo so that you can see sort of.